Good morning, everyone. God's grace and peace be with you on this glorious Reformation Sunday morning as we come to gather in spaces perhaps beyond this, spaces that move into your family homes. Excuse me, folks. I'm trying to remove my mask and it's not being polite. <laughs> uh, spaces that uh, reflect places of love in your heart. This morning we will be talking about the Lord's greatest commandment mm -hmm. and considering the ways in which God calls us to love one another in this day, a trying day for so many and yet a God-given day. A few announcements before we begin our worship this morning. One is that the trustees will be meeting via Zoom this Wednesday at 7 o'clock. If you are a trustee, please keep your eye open to my invitation to join. Next week is All Saints Day. We will be remembering the saints of the church and also sharing together in Holy Communion. So I invite you to bring to the table a beverage and some form of, of wafer or food that you can use to remember the gift of Christ's sacrifice for our lives. Also, Daylight Savings Time ends next sun, uh, Saturday evening into Sunday morning, so make sure that you set your clocks back Otherwise, you're going to be sitting there for a really long time next week until the service starts. We are working on a Thanksgiving devotional, which is nearly complete and will be assembled and prepared for you this week. If you are not a member of the church but would like to receive a copy of that devotional, reach out to us on our, on our, uh, through our website or to our church uh, address email address, and we will make sure to get a copy of that into your hands. Perhaps not by November 1st, but we'll do our best. Also, I should mention that I was a commissioner to the Synod of the Northeast this past weekend, and I was blessed and honored to serve in that capacity. And one of the things that I do bring back to you is that the Synod has, the Synod Assembly has approved the request of the seven presbyteries in New Jersey to merge in a different fashion, reducing in size from seven to four presbyteries. Our church will at some point become part of the Northeast Presbytery. It will be renamed, I'm sure. I don't know that they'll have a renaming contest, but it will reflect who we are as people of God in the 21st century. So we are grateful for that. The, the approval still has to be brought before the General Assembly the next time that they meet. But from this point forward, the presbyteries can move in the direction of a new way forward. And for all our children out there, have a happy and safe and blessed Halloween. And now our beautiful prelude by Miss Lilia.
Thank you, that was beautiful. Our worship of song and liturgy begins this morning with a call to worship that comes from <laughs> Psalm 90. The translation that we're using this morning is from the Common English Bible. Listen as I offer up sentences of scripture offered to us through the psalmist. Lord, you have been our help generation after generation. Before the mountains were born, before you birthed the earth and the inhabited world, from forever in the past to forever in the future, you are God. Teach us to number our days so we can have a wise heart. Fill us full every morning with your faithful love so we can rejoice and celebrate our whole life long. Let your acts be seen by your servants. Let your glory be seen by their children. Let the kindness of the Lord, our God, be over us. Make the work of our hands last. Make the work of our hands last. Now join me, please, in our opening prayer. Let us pray. Wondrous God, 13 billion years ago, your creative spark called creation into being. 2,000 years ago, you lit a spark of new creation in Christ. 500 years ago, your grace reignited the hearts of men and women with names like Martin Luther, John Calvin, Katharina Zell, and Ulrich Zwingli. Just when we think all is settled, everything is finished, closed, your power and presence explodes onto the scene yet again, bringing newness, bringing life. Fill us with your power and presence, O oh God, so we may, like our grandparents in faith, carry your truth, your beauty, and your justice to the world you so love, a world in such need. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our opening song, of course, is one of the greatest songs of the Reformation era, written for us by Martin Luther, A Mighty Fortress.
morning, I would invite the children to spend a little bit of time with me. Today is the day on the church calendar, which is known as Reformation Sunday. Now, we all know what Sunday means. The word Reformation might be a little bit harder, but the root of that word is the word reform. And reform can also mean things like remake or reshape. So this morning, I would like you to consider something with me. I'm going to be working with some putty this morning. And we all know that when the world began, it began as a gift of God's love and grace and beauty. The creation was glorious. And then, with time, people managed to make a mess of things, you might say. And even after the church was born and people celebrated the gift of God's love that we come to know in Jesus Christ, there were rules that were made that kind of pounded on the people and on the creation, making it much more flat, almost as if it was burdened by the pain of all of those rules and laws that didn't actually come from the Bible but came from the human mind. And throughout history, there have been times when people have stepped in and said, we've gotten too far away from the Bible. We gotta get back to what God calls us to do, what God invites us to say and be. There have been times that the prophets spoke. You can read the Old Testament, it's full of prophets. And there have been times since the dawn of the church that prophets have spoken to. Today we remember some of the prophets that spoke about 500 years ago about the church having strayed too far from God's will and being burdened by those things that laid heavy on their shoulders and on their minds. And so those great reformers started asking people, what does God invite us? to look like, to feel like, to speak like, to say. And almost like putty in my hands, the world began to reflect a little bit more what God intended. Now, sometimes putty works best when it is warmed by the hands. Imagine that warmth and the putty of earth and the church being like God's love for humankind. The more we feel and experience that love, the more we open ourselves up to know that God is with us and God loves us, the more the world begins to seem much less flat, much less like the creation God intended. A global universe where people are all equal, where everyone has a place at the table of grace, where no one is turned away from God's love, for God's love is vital to us all. Of course, sometimes if the putty gets dried out, the great potter needs to add a little bit of water to moisten it, to keep it soft so the edges are not so rough. For Christians, that blessing of water is our baptism. When we were brought before the gathered congregation and God to be baptized, we were sealed with Christ's spirit, marked with a love that never ends, and promised that no matter how tough times got, God would be with us always. God works in the waters of that baptism into our lives so that the things that are worrisome to the world are less worrisome to us because we know that God is with us and God will see us through. So every time the world threatens by fear, antagonism, bullying, to say, this world really stinks, we need something more, we remember the gift of our baptism. We remember the gift of God's love. We share that love with one another we open ourselves up to the waters of the Spirit and we say, come, Jesus, come into the world that we might all know that God loves each and every one of us and God will do everything in God's power to keep us in peace. That is what Reformation Sunday is all about. God, the one and only God, 
loves each and every one of us and takes the burdens that would flatten us onto God's own shoulders and says, love the world, dear friends. Love your neighbor as yourself. With that thought in mind, then, we turn to our prayer of confession. And we remember that God came to each and every one of us in the person of Jesus Christ to help show us the way, the way forward, the way to God, the way to peace, the way to global unity and a love shared by all. And yet we must confess that there are times when we do not abide by God's loving will for us. Instead, we abide by our, our own human sinfulness. And so it is right and fitting that before we hear the word this morning, we confess to God those sins, knowing that Christ alone is the one who could convict us of those sins, and yet Christ chooses instead to offer us the waters of baptism and to go to the cross for our sake. So join with me, please, in our prayer of confession from your home in this sacred space, we offer up this prayer to God. Precious Savior, Holy Lord, we come to you this day knowing that we have not always followed your ways, nor have we imitated your gracious love toward the children of our great creator. We have blamed the poor for their own struggles. We have crossed our arms and smugly looked upon the needy with eyes of arrogance, insisting that they are the authors of their own misfortune. Forgive us our arrogance and our ignorance. Forgive us when we do not see our neighbors as brothers and sisters deserving of love, both yours and ours. Forgiving, forgive us when we do not love you, the Lord our God, with every fiber of our being. Call us into your ways of justice, peace, and mercy. In your name we pray. And now, Lord, we offer to you our silent prayers of confession trusting that you do hear and that you respond with sacred love. Amen. As I said to the children, at the time of our baptism, we were marked by the Spirit and spiritually cleansed by the power of our Lord so that we might experience life and love in its fullness. Friends, trust in God's place in your life. Trust that God is the one and only God known to us in the three persons of the Trinity. Trust in the good news that God's love is ever-present and that there is nothing, nothing that could happen to separate us from that love so long as we are open to it. So trust in this good news, be at peace, for you are forgiven by the grace of God. Amen. I'm stepping away this morning from the usual uh, lectionary text for the Old Testament because I wanted to share the account in Deuteronomy 6 of the great commandment. Now, I should say that this, this first lesson from Deuteronomy 6, verses 1 through 9, um, contains within it what is probably the most well-known and well-loved verses of Scripture by our Jewish brothers and sisters. And that is verse 4 of this text, in which it is said that the Lord is our God and the Lord is one. The beginning of that verse in the original Hebrew begins with the word Shema. It's sometimes pronounced Shema. But in the Shema, we hear this word of, of being called to understand, to receive the news that God is one and God is with us, that God is singularly the powerful authority, the most powerful authority in the world, and that God is our unity even in our diversity, the one and only God. Lord and King of all. Our Jewish brothers and sisters who are strong adherents to the faith lift up verse 4 of our lesson this morning regularly in their lives. This is how powerful it is to them. It has the same weight and measure, if not 
perhaps even more to them, of course, as the Lord's Prayer has measure in our hearts. So listen, especially for this verse. But I'm going to share with you what verse 4 sounds like in Hebrew. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Once again. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel. Hear, O Israel. The Lord is one God. The Lord is one. And now, all of those nine verses. Now, this is the commandment, the statutes and the ordinances that the Lord your God charged me to teach you to observe in the land that you are about to cross into and occupy so that, your, so that you and your children and your children's children may fear the Lord your God all the days of your life and keep all his decrees and his commandments that I am commanding you so that your days may be long. Hear therefore, O Israel, and observe them diligently so that it may go well with you and so that you may multiply greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey, as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, has promised you. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Keep these words that I am commanding you today in your heart. Recite them to your children and talk about them when you are at home and when you are away, when you lie down and when you rise. Bind them as a sign on your hand. Fix them as an emblem on your forehead and write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now our morning solo by our soloist Clarence Davis, who I will introduce to you later on this morning. Race 
in vain. Thank you, Clarence. That is a good deal of what the Reformation is all about. God guiding our feet so that we don't run the Christian race in vain, but instead follow the words of the Lord. And speaking of the words of the Lord, we turn to Matthew 22, our gospel lesson this morning. This is part of Jesus' encounter with the temple leaders uh, during the time of pilgrimage to, to Jerusalem uh, at the time of Passover. Um, and Jesus has already gone to town with the Sadducees, who were the temple lawyers of the day. And now the Pharisees, who are more the, the ritual leaders of the day, um, come to speak with Jesus. Hear these words. When the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them this question. What do you think of the Messiah? Whose son is he? They said to him, the son of David. He said to them, how is it then that David, by the spirit, calls him Lord, saying, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If David thus calls him Lord, how can he be his son? No one was able to give Jesus an answer, nor from that day did anyone dare to ask him any more questions. Don't you love it? I do. Let us pray. Gracious and holy God, what a gift to us your scriptures are. May we remember, dear Lord, that it is abiding by your holy word that we are called to do, and it is by living out your holy word that we become faithful stewards of a living word. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be found to be acceptable in your sight, our living Lord, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Our lesson from Deuteronomy this morning makes an essential profession of faith about God's oneness and greatness while also providing details about how the faith, how our faith, should be lived out. We are to love God with all our being and then to teach that love to our children, reciting prayers of faithful witness when we wake up in the morning and when we lie down at night and binding those prayers to our body, heart, mind, and soul. This act of faithfulness is still a practice among the adherents of the Jewish faith today. And as a way of reminding themselves to say this prayer at the start and conclusion of each day, many Jewish observers have a tiny scroll in their home on which the Shema is written. Remember again those words. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. That tiny little scroll is ro rolled up and put in a decorative little case on a doorpost somewhere in the home. That little scroll is called a mezuzah. And one of those cases, the mezuzah case, resides on the doorframe to the bedroom at your manse. The scroll is gone, but the beautiful case is still there testifying to the rich faithfulness of the former owners of the home. Knowing this about our Jewish brothers and sisters, it might seem somewhat surprising then that the Pharisees ask this question, 
of Jesus. What is the greatest commandment? They are trying to test him. Now, they knew he was a rabbi, and they even commend him at one point for his knowledge of scripture. So why this question was the one they chose to ask is still a mystery to me. But what isn't a mystery is the way in which Jesus chooses to respond. We are, he says, to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our mind. And then he attaches a second commandment to his response, that of loving our neighbors as we love ourselves. Going so far as to say that on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Like a mezuzah of the heart, mind, and soul, following scripture's greatest commandments testifies to our faithfulness. I suppose if you wanted to, you could call Jesus a bit sneaky here, affixing a second commandment to the first and then calling the combination the greatest and first commandments. You might even argue that Jesus is trying to trip up the temple leaders a bit by saying, I'll even go you one better, guys. But I don't, feel, I don't think that that's really what's going on here. Rather, Jesus is linking together the love of God and love of neighbor in a rather novel and perhaps even radical way. He's telling the privileged class, of which the Pharisees were a part, that they have equal value in God's eyes to all God's children, and that God loves all these equally valued children without exception, even those whom we would call enemies, because they too are made in God's image, and they too are to be loved. Now Jesus is pushing the envelope here, and frankly, you can hate the, the politics of your neighbors, even your enemies, all you want. But you can't hate your neighbors, is what Jesus is saying here. You cannot revile them, or bully them, or libel them, or lie about them. Because to do so is to debase another child of God. And when we do that, we debase the image of the one and only God whose imprint is upon our heart, mind, and soul. The one whom we claim to love, honor, and respect. Now for the Pharisees, these were fighting words, especially since Jesus is telling all these fortunate ones that all the things that they depend on for their livelihoods and their authority are far less important to God than loving their neighbor. Jesus is making all those other laws about purity and cleanliness and all those many rituals and sacrifices that were so much a part of the temple life secondary to love and thus less important to God than upholding the greatest commandment. Jesus is effectively yanking out from under the feet of the temple leaders their status, their livelihoods, and their power. Is it any wonder then that they see Jesus as a threat to the status quo? Now, of course, in a similar way, Jesus is a threat to our status quo as well. We live in a nation today that's accustomed to stratifying people by virtue of their color, gender, ethnicity, religion, wealth, education, class, and on and on. We have lots of names for all these segregated layers of society. We have the in crowd and the out crowd, the blue Democrats and the red Republicans, the commie socialists and the right wing extremists, the whites and the blacks, the evangelical Christians, and all the rest. So when Jesus explains that the law and the prophets all hang on this commandment to love God and love neighbor, he is inviting us to hear what is being said. Shamach Yisrael, hear, O Israel. Hear, O children of God. God is God and God is one. And God wants us to follow in the footsteps of love. As those who are co-created in the image of the divine, we are called to work toward a holy communi community of people who care for one another. 
Jesus is not inviting us to love one another in the manner of a Hallmark movie, but in the manner of a faithful people who are challenged constantly to reevaluate our lives, to reform our commitments, and to remake even our politics, reorienting them in ways that honor the image of God deep within us all. Jesus isn't speaking of some kind of mushy, gushy love that is steeped in emotion. No, says New Testament scholar Douglas Hare. Hare says, in an age when the word love is greatly abused, it is important to remember that the primary component of biblical love is not affection, but commitment. Warm feelings of gratitude may fill our consciousness as we consider all that God has done for us. But Deuteronomy 6.5 is not talking about warm feelings, but about stubborn, unwavering commitment. To love the neighbor, including our enemies, doesn't mean to feel affection for them, but to imitate God in taking their needs seriously. The type of love that Jesus is speaking of here has to do with caring for those who share in this global community with us. It has to do with acting in the best interests of all God's children. It has to do with seeing the intrinsic worth of each human being that graces this planet Earth and hearing the voice of the Lord saying, love these as much as you love yourself. Yes. Love the teacher who is working hard to educate your children in hybrid fashion. Love the medical personnel dedicated to preserving life, even at risk, to their own. Love the grocery store clerk who asks politely that you wear your mask. Love the pharmacist who stands to answer all your questions about how your medications may weaken your immune system and put you at risk for developing COVID-19. They are not the cause of your anxiety. They are merely messengers sharing scientific knowledge about how to keep you safe. Love the plumber or the roofer or the electrician who comes to your door seeking to resolve a housing issue and asking you and ask you politely to socially distance yourself from them as they work. Love the friend you haven't seen in seven months because of the pandemic and give them a call just to say thinking of you. Love the physical neighbor whose depression or age is keeping them indoors and gift them with a pot of chicken soup and a note that says, you are a child of God. Stay safe, stay well. God loves you. Love the hard worker who is trying their best to wear six hats at once and love the boss who is at their wit's end trying to keep the business afloat during this pandemic. Jesus is countering the notion that the love of God and the love of neighbor are somehow two parallel but separate fears of human responsibility by helping us to see that these two pieces, love of God and love of neighbor, are interconnected. They are interdependent loves. To love God is to love our neighbor. And to love the neighbor is to love God. And loving both God and neighbor is a form actually of Christian stewardship. It is God's tool for making the world in a manner that is consistent with the image of the one and only God who is the unity in our diversity. Such a holy love requires that we actually expect to find God's image in our neighbors, even our enemies. And while, up, while loving others may sound sweet and simple on its surface, it demands a commitment to reorienting ourselves to a new way of understanding the world as God originally and continues to intend it. Sharon Blessard, an ELCA pastor, asks if hearing the greatest commandment doesn't just make you want to start humming, all you need is love, and leave it at that. But of course, as both saints and sinners, there is this dual nature to our humanity that makes what could seem simple actually pretty hard to do. So Pastor Sharon offers us this thought. 
Our culture, with its me-first emphasis and heavy marketing to the idea of self-fulfillment, makes Jesus' words an even tougher sell. Love may be patient and kind and all that jazz, she says, but it's also tough. It works better as a verb than as a noun. Loving God and loving neighbor is a lifestyle, not something one can turn on and off like a water faucet. It's a process, not a one-time decision. One grows into and leans into love. By engaging in a life of loving God and neighbor, one chooses an alternate path, a path that is both countercultural and far less traveled. The good news is that when we undergo the process of a life of loving God and neighbor, she says, we conform to the divine intentions for life, which result in a fresh sight, a clearer vision, and renewed hope. Scripture lives and breathes, providing an organic pattern for one's life. When we love God and neighbor, surrendering self to the greater call of discipleship, there is enough, and there is enough to share, both of God and of self. It's the kind of life one has to try to understand. Chances are, once a person embraces this life of love, all manner of surprises and possibilities will unfold. God is good that way, she says, and then offers up these words. Forget the hollow promises of prosperity gospel and try the real thing, the gospel of love. On this Reformation Sunday, not only do we remember the gifts of John Calvin and Martin Luther, we also remember the spiritual commitment of another great reformer that we don't speak of nearly enough. His name was Ulrich Zwingli. And he pastored a church in Zurich during the 16th century. Early in his ministry there, Zwingli fell ill with the bubonic plague, a disease which killed between a quarter and a half of the residents of that city. For months and months, Zwingli struggled to shake the disease before finally recovering. During that time, though, he wrote what has since become known as Zwingli's Plague Song, and in that song, he spoke of his acceptance of divine providence, saying, do what thou wilt, Lord. Me, nothing lacks. Thy vessel am I to make or break altogether. And then he made promises of future faithful acts, saying, then my lips must thy praise and teaching bespeak more, more than ever however it may go, however it may go. Zwingli really didn't know whether the disease would take his life or not, but that didn't deter him from trusting in the one true eternal God, the unity in our diversity, nor did it stop him from pursuing love as a lifestyle, growing into love and choosing the alternate path of engaging in a life of loving God and loving neighbor. It is said that his spiritual commitment deepened after his bout with the plague and that he became a better, more compassionate neighbor as a result of that pandemic. Friends, during this time of weariness, as we all suffer from pandemic election and media fatigue, it is good to know that God is with us and it is a good time to commit ourselves to a continuous discernment of how God in Christ is calling us to meet the social, economic, and spiritual challenges of this time through a faithful adherence to the Lord's commandment to love. Yes, my friends, Jesus is a threat to our status quo, but may it be said of us that we have heard the living word and have lived as if that word really does matter. Hear, O oh children, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we thank you for the gift of your holy word to us 
this morning. We know, Lord, that you call us to love, but we also know that we live in a time of great upheaval where love does not seem to be the common calling whatsoever. Help us to see the gift of your image residing in each and every one of our neighbors, that even if we don't like their politics, even if we don't like what they do or what they stand for, we still know that within them is the sign of your image. And when we cast aspersions on, on that image of you, dear Lord, we cast aspersions on you. Help us to love and help us to seek that alternate pathway to living a life dedicated to loving you and loving our neighbor. In Christ we pray. Amen. This morning, our stewardship moment is actually going to be a sharing together in what I'm calling a reformation moment. As I was saying before, love is a form of stewardship. When we love others as we love ourselves, we find that there is enough and there is enough to share. That is stewardship. And so let us, with hearts made new in Christ, share together in this Reformation moment, offering up these words of affirmation. We give thanks for the gift of the Holy Spirit, whose light brings us new understanding of both the living word and the written scripture. We give thanks for the reminder of consistent grace and mercy from God through Jesus Christ. We are grateful for the inspiration that led to the printing press, enabling the spread of information and the sharing of the gospel in many languages, and for the technologies that can be used for good, for the support of communities and individuals. Generous God, we thank you for open hearts that were prepared to hear and receive the good news of freedom in Christ and for our continued freedom in the Son to share that same news of salvation through your grace and Christ's faithfulness. We remember the lives that were lost in the struggle to reform the church on earth, those who were martyred, those who died fighting, those who perished in hiding and who were killed on all sides. Continuing on with the next slide, we remember also the lives that have been lost throughout history in the name of religion and for those who die today for daring to believe. We thank you for the instruction that comes through our church heritage, the catechisms, the understanding of the saints, the gift of community, and a deeper appreciation of God's gift of holy communion and holy baptism. We thank you for the presence of Jesus Christ in us, with us, and for us, and for the support of the Holy Spirit ever reforming us. God of stability and change, we thank you that true reformation is always your work and is done in us out of your love for your whole creation. We are ever reformed by the work of your love. Semper Reformanda, the church reformed and always reforming. Let me see if I have any prayer concerns shared with me this morning. It looks like I do have some. The Clarks have sent in a prayer request for Greg, that's uh, Dawn's husband, Greg, who will be undergoing a surgery to remove a mass from his bladder this week. Let us keep Greg in our prayers. I would also ask this morning for prayers for Michael Moriello. Michael is Erna Allen's son-in-law. He has had an absolutely miserable year in and out of the hospital and rehab centers. Uh, He's back in the hospital once again. I would invite your prayers of healing for Michael, but also your prayers of support, comfort, and love for his wife, Diane, who who has stood by his side throughout all of this ordeal. Prayers also for Lori Ulrich, who continues to have medical problems, especially with headaches. We pray, dear Lord, for Jean Zabalski, 
uh, who continues to decline and ask that the Lord be gracious with her as she prepares herself, heart, mind, and soul for the gift of eternal life. I have been asked to share with you the good news that Hunter Cunningham, the very small great-grandson of Gladys Geezer, came through his surgery well. You'll remember that surgery was to repair a cleft palate. He does still have to go back for some more work, but he came through it well. He's thriving. He was sitting on grandma, great-grandma Gladys's lap yesterday, and they both looked as happy as happy could be. So we are thankful for that gift of healing. We also remember in our prayers this morning another family, and that is the family of Marilyn Fox Alexa, who passed away this week. Uh, she is being cremated, but um, her graveside service uh, for family only will be this week. So let us open our hearts to the Lord. Let us pray. Creator God, you have filled the world with beauty. Open our eyes to behold your gracious hand in all your works that rejoicing in your whole creation, we may learn to love and serve you with gladness for the sake of him by whom all things were made, your son Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Lord God, we thank you for the many reformers through the years who have called us to reconsider our lives of faith through the lens of scripture and have invited us to reshape, reform, remake our lives wherever change is necessary. Help us to remember them and give thanks for their service and witness to the church. We remember to you, dear Lord, the U.S. nation, we remember also all the other nations of the world, but we especially remember our nation some nine days before an election which could threaten to leave the United States in a great deal of turmoil. Help us, Lord, to have steady minds, calm voices, and loving actions in the midst of what could be a very large ordeal. Help us, dear Lord. We also pray for all of those who are suffering with COVID-19, especially as the pandemic heats up again, as the windows are closed, the doors are shut, and the heat comes on. So do the number of cases rise. Be with us, dear Lord, that we might find ways to keep one another safe. Mask, social distancing, caring for one another. These are all things we can do on the ground to make sure we keep ourselves and our neighbors safe. We remember to you, dear Lord, the gift of love and the goodness of that love which calls us to a steadfastness in faith. May we remember to be your faithful servants, Lord. May we remember to follow in truth where you lead us, being honest and transparent as much as we can, that all may see in us the sign of your image, the symbol of your love deep within. Lord God, we offer to you prayers for Michael Moriello, Lori Ulrich, Jean Zabelski, Greg Clark. Be with them in their time of need. Be also with the family of Marilyn Alexa as they say their goodbyes and see you on the other side to their great, wonderful, beloved Marilyn. And finally, Lord, we thank you for the gift of surgery gone well for little Hunter <coughs> Cunningham, who now has a chance to live a full and healthy life. Thank you for this blessing, dear Lord. And now we offer to you the prayer which Jesus has taught us all when praying to say together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, 
and the glory forever. Amen. And may it be so. Our closing song this morning is, Lord, I Want to Be a Christian. Clarence, he's shy. Not really. <laughs> Friends, you've heard the word of God this morning. Go out into the world with peace, but love God, the one and only God, with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, as, as Luke might say, and love your neighbor as yourself. It is a heavy duty charge. I understand that, especially when tensions abound and people are saying mean, vindictive things. Don't fall prey to that. Instead, look for the sign of God within each of your neighbors. Look for that image of grace. Look for the creator's beauty within each soul. And now, friends, Clarence is joining me here up front. We want to thank you for singing and joining us this morning. This is my neighbor whom I love. And you too are my neighbors whom I love. So remember that God is with you. And now may the grace of our love, uh, excuse me, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit, the one true God, the unity in our diversity, be with us all this day and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace. Amen.